Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first HEI Energy Webinar, Human Exposure Research in a Cyclical Industry Part 1, Air Emissions from the Unconventional Oil and Natural Gas Development. So the purpose of today's webinar is to describe unconventional oil and gas operations that emit noise and chemicals to outdoor air, and that might result in community exposures and how they vary across space and time. The other purpose is to describe operational information needed for decision makers to protect public health and to enhance utility of human exposure research from both the federal perspective and the state perspective. So just some housekeeping items. All attendees are muted with no audio for the duration of the webinar. You can submit questions via the, via the Q&A function, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote questions from other participants that match your own. We'll have a brief, brief Q&A period if we have time after each talk and a 25 minute panel discussion where we'll answer your questions at the end of the session. The webinar will be recorded and posted to our website. If you do experience any logistical difficulties, please email us at um, the email listed below. And we'll also send you a survey after the webinar. Please complete it. We'd really appreciate your feedback. So just an overview of HA Energy, who we are. We're an independent nonprofit chartered to deliver research that's useful to communities, policymakers, and others on human exposures associated with onshore um, development of oil and natural gas from, share, from shale and other unconventional resources. The program and the research that it funds is overseen by a committee with expertise in petroleum engineering, hydrology, atmosphere chemistry, statistics, epidemiology, toxicology, and exposure assessment. And so for the question and answer period, I also want to show you that this is where you can find the Q&A. And so with that, um, I'll introduce our first speaker, Ethan Carter. Ethan is an environmental engineer in the unconventional business. He has 10 years of experience working on environmental and sustainability issues in the un unconventional oil and gas and chemical sectors. He holds a degree in chemical engineering from University of Arkansas and has an MBA in sustainable business from Mer Merrill Hurst University. Thank you, Ethan. We look forward to your talk. Thanks so much. All right, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, again, my name is Ethan Carter, and thanks for uh, uh, folks, to, thanks to HEI for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Uh, looking forward to the discussion with some great panelists later on. Uh, I'm here today on uh, representing a, a, a coalition of folks in industry that have been helping HEI with this uh, with this work, and we're going to talk about um, about unconventional oil and gas operations, as well as some of the general air and noise considerations that we have in in different phases of the operation throughout un unconventional oil and gas development. Uh, so the things we're going to go through, I'm going to talk through those phases and what they are, how long they tend to last. Um, as well as uh, you know, some of the different, uh, when the activity level is high versus low, things like that. Um, we'll, we'll talk some then, we'll get in quite a bit of equipment as well as the emissions potential from some of that equipment where, uh, where it exists, where the primary sources are that we worry about. Um, and, and then we'll get into some of the differences in different basins, different geographies, uh, as well as uh, different trends that might impact uh, both air, air emissions as well as noise. Uh, there's some things changing in the industry. The industry is constantly evolving. And so uh, we'll touch on some of those issues in terms of how they might affect both air and noise emissions going forward. So to start off, uh, the phases of, of unconventional development, uh, and again, I, I do want to emphasize throughout this that it, the unconventional space is highly variable. Um, there's a lot of different aspects that can change significantly, these timelines being one of them. Um, but generally, this is the, the uh, timeline that, that things tend to follow. Um, I will say that unconventional development, what really distinguishes unconventional from conventional development is really what goes on in the subsurface. Uh, so when you see, hear about horizontal drilling, as well as how we complete the wells with hydraulic fracturing uh, to unlock the shale formations, that's really what we mean when we say unconventional development. Uh, it does impact what goes on on the surface. We're not today, I'm not going to focus on the differences of, of what happens underground, uh, but do know that when we talk about unconventional development, it is that horizontal drilling 
uh, along with hydraulic fracturing that typically distinguishes it from more conventional vertical well production. So the first part is, is site preparation. Uh, this is really comes down to mostly just moving, uh, moving dirt around. It's any typical construction. Uh, it, it's a pretty typical construction operation when you're preparing the site. Uh, this could, you know, usually lasts around a month or so. It can be shorter, it can be longer. Um, there's a, the construction equipment coming to and from site, as well as uh, getting the site prepared and uh, for the other equipment to come in. Um, once we start drilling, that typically lasts uh, around a month to 90 days. It can depend significantly on whether we have a single or multi-well pad, and we'll talk about some of those differences as we go through. Uh, completions as well, um, it can be highly variable, but typically lasts about, uh, about 10 to 30 days. The hydraulic fracturing piece of that takes place for about three to five days per well. Um, again, that depends on how many wells are on the pad in terms of how much equipment is on site for how long. That hydraulic fracturing phase, I, uh, I call out specifically because there's so much activity during that, uh, that particular time, but it is a very short amount of time in the span of the life of the well. Uh, then we'll talk about production, and that goes on for, for 30 or more years, uh, depending on the ability of the well to last, uh, to, to produce for that long, as well. And then uh, we'll touch a little bit on, on post-production as well as we go through the talk. So this is a, 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 a photo of a pretty typical site with two rigs working at once. Um, this is a rather large site. Sometimes you'll just see one rig working, even if it's drilling multiple, uh, multiple wells at once. Um, so the, the rigs are actually capable of drilling multiple wells. You can, if you look closely below the rig, you'll see kind of steel uh, beams that run left to right. And those are, uh, that allows the rig to actually move without being taken all the way down and, and physically moved. Uh, so it can drill a well and then move over and then drill another well. Um, this goes into, uh, this allows the efficiencies in terms of uh, time on the site as well as moving between sites is very expensive. Um, but that doesn't uh, necessarily impact our, our air or noise emissions. So the, the, big, the, the big part of the rig is actually not where most of the air and noise comes from. Uh, so the arrows here are kind of indicating our main pieces of uh, equipment that we'll have um, is on site that have air and noise associated with them. Uh, the main thing is most of the rig actually runs on electricity. And so we have to generate that electricity on site if, if it's not accessible. Uh, the standard practice is to use diesel generators. And so those are on site. Um, that's where a lot of the, the noise comes from, as well as uh, you have air emissions associated with, um, with those generators as well. Uh, the mud pumps are, are there, they're powered uh, from the generators, but I want to talk a little bit about the mud system. Uh, so what drilling mud essentially is a fluid that can be either water-based, it's usually water-based when the, uh, the well is initially drilled through the aquifer, but then as we drill in the deeper shale formations, it's usually hydrocarbon-based. Uh, and so we, the mud is stored in the mud pits, and then it's pumped downhole, which helps lubricate the bit, as well as bring the, the cuttings of the rock back to the surface. And then uh, the mud goes through the settling pits to allow those drill cuttings to fall out and be, uh, and be separated, and then the mud is, is reused and recirculated. So it's, a, it's generally a closed loop system, uh, but because the mud is hydrocarbon based, there are different types of muds. Uh, that can have different types of emissions associated with them uh, because there is settling and they, they are out. So that is one consideration in part of the drilling process. Um, we'll touch on trends a little bit later, but I do want to mention here that one, one significant trend is the, the trend toward trying to use uh, electricity from the grid where available, which that uh, eliminates a lot of the need for diesel generation on site with drilling rigs. We've started to see this from several operators now in, in the Permian Basin especially, but elsewhere as well. Uh, moving on to hydraulic fracturing. So after the wells are drilled, um, then uh, the frac crews come onto site. So this is a, a, a frac crew that's set up to, uh, to fracture a few different wells. Uh, the, the arrows kind of show the flow of water onto the location. Um, so, but we're not as much concerned about the water today. So the water comes in, it's, uh, it's stored and heated, 
Um, and then it's pumped in, it's mixed with sand. So the, you can see the sand storage down on the bottom left. Um, and the, most of the emissions on this site are gonna come from our pumps. Um, there's a, several diesel pumps. These, are, these trucks are typically diesel. Um, there are, have been a lot of uh, movements in the industry toward using natural gas, as well as using uh, even um, grid electricity where it's available. Uh, that can change the uh, emissions profile of, a, of the hydraulic fracturing job. Um, there's some chemicals as well that are included in the, that are included in the, um, in the fluid before it's pumped down hole. Um, but we, th that's a very small percentage and those are, are usually uh, well controlled. Um, and so it's really mostly water and sand that's pumped down. Uh, so we really have uh, the focus here for our for emissions is really on those diesel generators, um, as well as the truck traffic going to and from the location. So we use a lot of water and a lot of sand. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis in the industry on trying to get truck traffic down. Uh, so a lot of times water is piped, uh, as well as sand is is moved in different ways. You can see these storage cubes that are there, this allows the sand to be brought in and stored on site instead of trucks coming in and out of the, the operation consistently. Uh, but as you can see, there are a lot of trucks on this site currently. And so there, there are, uh, there's quite a bit of truck traffic. Uh, you can have dust, uh, you can have sand coming uh, on the location. Um, the sand is, is much uh, better controlled than it um, once was, I think. Um, and we, you know, we, the industry has done a lot of work to try and make sure that the sand movement is enclosed so that there's not uh, concerns around silica exposure or anything like that. So that's been something that uh, the industry has seen a lot of success in over time. Um, this is the same kind of operation, uh, but with two different frack crews working at the same time. So again, much like the picture of the drilling rig where we had two drilling rigs on the same site, uh, you can have pretty heavily concentrated activity. Uh, this is becoming more, uh, more and more common in the industry to have multiple uh, fracks running at once. There's a few different reasons for this that we won't uh, bother getting into today, uh, but it can uh, create a lot of activity. Uh, I'll also mention that um, you know, sometimes you, you know, these phases of development aren't necessarily linear. You may have some drilling that happens uh, that's then followed by, uh, uh, by a frack, and then a few years later, uh, it'll happen again at the same location. So a drilling rig can come back, uh, drill another, another well or, or multiple more wells, um, and then uh, the frack crews can return as well. So you can see it's the same types of equipment, uh, just more of it on the location. Touch briefly on, uh, on coil tubing operations as well. Sorry about that. Uh, the coil tubing operations. So this is when after the, the well is, is drilled and then fractured, uh, the, uh, when we fracture the well, they place plugs down the well to separate out the fracturing zones. Um, and so those uh, are, are drilled out to allow the well to start producing. Uh, so on this, you see we have the, the, wellhead is, the wellheads are there. Um, you have the essentially uh, all flowback is, is really when you hear the term uh, flowback, it's essentially just the initial phase of production. Um, a lot of times you have the sand come some quite a bit of sand coming back up the well board that you don't want in your uh, in your gas and oil streams, um, and a lot of water coming back initially from the that was used in the frac in the fracturing job. Um, so there's kind of an initial phase of production that allows that water and sand to kind of come back up, so that the oil and gas can can really begin to flow. So the reason that that's called out specifically is because there are often a lot of special pieces of equipment that remain on site temporarily. Uh, and um, sometimes there's different levels of control in terms of the uh, flowback tanks, uh, wh whether they're open or whether they're controlled. Um, you can see this particular site has a, a flow line to a flare stack. Um, I, ideally, we send the gas to, to sales uh, immediately where possible and as quickly as possible. 
um, so that there's no waste of gas. But in some cases, there is some need to, to flare a little bit during flowback. Um, the tanks here, uh, so you'll have both oil and water tanks in an oil production facility. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the differences in a minute. Uh, but uh, those are, tanks are always, um, hydro, tanks with hydrocarbons in them are always going to have emissions associated with them. Um, and uh, that's, that's where a lot of the focus is in terms of how those are controlled, uh, as well as how, um, whether we're able to flow directly to those uh, as part of the flow bag. Once the well is, uh, is completed and uh, drilled out and the production's returned to normal pace, uh, normal pace, then we really have a pretty simple set of facilities on site. Uh, so this is a dry gas production facility in, in Pennsylvania. So you can see in the middle, you have the, the wellheads. I know it's a little bit of a difficult image to see because it's a, but it's a good way to get a picture of what, uh, what is and isn't on the, the pad still after all the equipment is gone from, from the more intensive phases of operations. So we have the, the wellheads uh, are, are in the middle. Uh, the lines are, are usually buried on these sites um, for, for safety, if nothing else. Um, and then you have heaters and separators. So there's separators that uh, on a dry gas production facility, you will have some water associated with it. And so you'll have, uh, you'll have usually water gas separation on the, the site to allow the gas to go into the pipeline. Uh, heaters as well to keep the, the lines from, from freezing where necessary. And then you'll have produced water tanks. So water does come up with the gas and that has to be stored on site. And sometimes it, sometimes it can contain hydrocarbons as well. Um, a compression facility here. So these compressors are actually inside of buildings. Uh, this is you, this is typically a noise abatement, um, a, a noise abatement practice. Uh, it's uh, pretty common nowadays to see compressor compression facilities in buildings. Uh, the compressors are usually natural gas driven. Um, although we again we've seen some trend toward electrification in the industry where it's possible. Uh, but the, the use of natural gas is pretty typical for compression because it's, uh, it, it's in the, the stream already as a fuel. <clears throat> so um, here you see you have compressors on the site, you have dehydrators on the site, which help separate, uh, you have glycol dehydrators that uh, separate more water out of the gas to bring it down to pipeline quality. Um, because uh, water in the lines can cause, can cause trouble further down the uh, the stream, as well as their separation and uh, additional um, water separation equipment and heaters as well at this point. Oil production facilities uh, look a little different. Um, so this is a, a pretty typical well pad with, uh, you'll have both oil and water tanks um, in order to store the, uh, the, the oil as well as water. The separation facilities are a little more complex as well, because you're not just separating out water from gas, you're separating out oil from water and uh, oil from gas. So you'll have three phase separation. Um, sometimes the tanks are on site as is pictured here. Um, other times you'll just have uh, well production equipment on uh, well heads on the site and they'll flow to a central tank battery. And those tank batteries are, are really what they sound like. They just have the tanks uh, as well as some of the separation on those sites. It allows operators to have several well locations in the immediate area and then do all of the separation and, and storage in one place um, at, before sending it to pipeline or, or truck or however the, uh, the oil is meant to be moved. Um, these pump jacks are on this location. So initially, uh, wells flow. Uh, kind of on their own, but over time as they produce, you may need some type of artificial lift, uh, which these pump jacks are uh, meant to allow the oil to flow more freely. There are similar, um, there are similar practices with respect to, to gas wells as well. Um, sometimes there's gas lift compression uh, where, more, where you'll uh, have a small compressor on site that will compress gas and put it into the well to stimulate more production. Um, you may also have uh, uh, other types of artificial lift as well that we don't really have time to get into today, uh, but those do have equipment and, and emissions associated with them. Um, 
this is one of those tank batteries that I referenced. So you can see there's no well production equipment here. Um, you just have the separation equipment as well as uh, the storage for oil and water. Um, you may have some truck traffic coming to and from these sites if there are, is no pipeline infrastructure. Uh, but the preference usually is to have pipelines for both the oil and the water as well. Uh, but this allows for stabilization of the, the oil um, uh, before it's uh, sent to a processing facility or into a pipeline. Um, and uh, really, again, the tank, um, the tank vapors are, are the source of emissions at these types of sites. You'll see this site in particular even has a, a emissions collection along the top. That's what those yellow pipes are. Uh, to allow uh, for a vapor recovery unit to recover a lot of the tank vapors so that uh, the emissions are minimized from the site. These can be driven by uh, you know, operator practice. They can uh, be driven by regulation, by permitting requirements. Uh, it really depends on a lot of different factors in terms of what controls are and aren't put on, on different sites. So I'll close just by touching a little bit. So uh, on on some of the changes, I think one of the big things to note, um, it, the unconventional space is highly variable and changes quite a bit. Um, things are are moving all the time uh, in terms of how long uh, how how long we're able to drill uh, wells, how much fluid is used in fracturing, which can impact the time that the uh, crews are on equipment, um, but you know there's always a drive to continually improve technology, and so there's it's a constantly shifting landscape, and we can get into a lot more detail in terms of how that has uh, how that has changed over time, and will continue to change over time. Um, I think one of the big trends that affects emissions and noise, particularly, is is the trend toward electrification. Um, there's a big interest in in using uh, electric where possible because it does minimize noise, uh, it minimizes on-site emissions, um, can allow for more efficiency. Um, the, uh, as well, so the, um, the, the centralization of uh, operations, and really what I mean by that is uh, I, it's more efficient if we can do as much as possible in one place for, for a lot of different reasons, for cost reasons, for, um, you know, if, uh, ability to minimize the impact on land if you're not making as many well pads. And so you're seeing operators use more and more wells where possible. Uh, because the drilling is directional, you're able to do quite a bit of, of production from an area from one centralized surface point. Um, so sometimes that does uh, increase the amount of activity at one place, uh, but it also minimizes the activity uh, in surrounding areas. Uh, it, and just one more mention on here for the differences in, in production equipment, uh, you know, that has significant differences uh, from geography to geography. And uh, so your, the equipment you see in terms of, uh, we didn't, I didn't show a, a processing plant today, but you, in oil uh, basins specifically, you'll have um, quite a bit of processing equipment as well after the production phase um, before it goes into the pipeline so that it's at a, a quality that the, uh, refineries and uh, end users are able to, to accept. Um, but uh, you may have much more simple facilities in a, in a dry gas where you don't need as much separation. You just may have dehydration and that water, water gas separation. So those are important things to, to consider as you're looking into how best to approach um, some of these emissions. Uh, with that, uh, the last picture here is of a, of a site that was formerly a production site and just wanted to say that you know, we, we do work in the industry to try and, and bring these sites back to as natural of a state as possible when they have reached the end of their life. Um, so that's a, uh, uh, and again, we continue to improve uh, how much, you know, we continue to improve this technology um, and the, we, just the highly variable nature of unconventional, I think, presents an interesting challenge for all um, you know all the folks on the on the call today who are interested in studying this. Um, and that's what I have, and looking forward to the rest of the talks. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Ethan. Um, so we're going to move on to our next speaker, Cindy Beeler. Cindy Beeler is the Oil and Gas Air Technical Advisor for Region 8 of the U.S. EPA. She focuses on Clean Air Act enforcement and compliance within the oil and gas sector, concentrating in the Uinta, Denver, Julesburg, and Upper Green River basins. She has a background in environmental engineering and previously served as Region 8's Energy Advisor. And I'm going to share her screen. One moment, please. <clears throat> okay, hello, C Anna, can you hear me? Anna, can you hear me? We can hear you, Cindy. Okay. <laughs> Phew, I was starting to sweat it. <laughs> okay, um, hi everybody. Um, we are, uh, I'm going to introduce you to um, the assignment I was given, which was what would be a wish list of operational information to collect uh, during these measurements to um, better understand the emissions to air. Next slide. Um, so why have a wish list? Um, it, first off, it's, it's going to be a list of operating parameters, process equipment, maintenance practices, and conditions um, that could be collected at the, at, at the facilities that are measured. Um, with the goal to transfer what is learned to the broader sector, um, in order to do that, we're going to have to correlate it, the, the measured emissions to operations operations and processes that were measured. You know, marry the emission measurements to specific processes to understand the reasons for those emissions and the differences in the emissions, uh, which can then inform mitigation. So I'll just, uh, I'll say this is a start and it's ripe for dialogue. So um, what I'm gonna present are parameters and conditions that that affect emissions and are either part of emission estimating methods or um, models. Okay, next slide. Uh, Ethan did a great job of giving you a sense of the drilling and hydraulic fracturing and completion phases. Um, and I'm gonna be focusing on production and going into a lot of detail there. Um, so uh, with all phases, as Ethan brought up, there'll be um, construction equipment and traffic and truck traffic involved. Um, and production, it'll be ongoing with the trucks that are going ferrying uh, oil or condensate or produced water offsite, as well as the construction equipment and building the site. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> So um, in preparation, uh, before you go on site, you could start gathering some information like this. Um, the production history of the wells, uh, the oil and gas and produced water volumes, um, the, get a design description of the site so you know what kind of equipment you have there. The, the simplified process flow diagram, um, and then the more detailed piping and instrumentation diagram, an example of that shown up here in the top right. So this is PNID just around a separator. And I mean, there, there, are, there is information in here as we get into talking about tank emissions. Uh, so even in here, what kind of vortex breaker do they have could be something that impacts emissions out of the tanks. Um, where are their liquid level controllers set? That, uh, those are things inside this separator that could impact unintentional gas carry through that manifests out of a tank. So um, uh, I will move on from there. And then an equipment list. Ideally an equipment list that includes the pneumatic devices because the pneumatic devices are shown to um, uh, contribute a fair portion at least of methane emissions um, at sites. And so it would be good to understand, you know, continuous bleed, intermittent, et cetera. Um, it'd be good to get a routine maintenance schedule that the operator is part of their uh, checklist that their pumpers go and, and um, check at the sites. 
um, because that, in, that could be that that's something that influences emissions. Um, and then lastly, the OGI camera, optical gas imaging or uh, uh, IR camera, um, because whatever emissions are measured and however they're measured, um, the OGI camera will be a good way to identify the particular source of the, those emissions. Um, and here in Region 8, we have a couple in Utah, we have a ULEN program where an IR camera is available to be borrowed. We also have that in the Denver DJ Basin area with the Regional Air Quality Control Commission has a camera that's available for loan. Um, and then the operators you work with likely have an OGI camera. Okay, next slide. So then we'll start with the, the sort of context of the well pad, you know, the field that it's in. Um, on the gas gathering pipeline side, what's the typical pressure of the gas gathering pipeline? Because that's going to drive the pressure of the separator on the site. And what's the variability in that pressure? I mean, that's, that's what we've been finding is that as sites get, um, as as gathering pipelines become more full and reach capacity, sites may get bumped off, which results in uh, venting or flaring of uh, associated gas. It'd be good to understand the variability in that uh, gas gathering pipeline. And then the pigging schedule um, and protocol that the, the operator uses uh, at the site, that's to clean out uh, liquids um, that may have accumulated in the pipelines. And then well information, as Ethan um, teed up, there's different um, times of a well when artificial lift may be used. So just make sure that you're noting what kind of artificial lift is used. Um, chemicals that are injected at the well would be good to understand. Some chemicals have an affinity for water, like methanol, for example, and then that could stick with the produced water. Um, and so we, since this is a health effects uh, um, study, we'll want to understand the sort of uh, hazardous air pollutants that are involved in a site. And some of these chemicals that are injected like methanol are an example of a, of a HAP. Um, and then well maintenance and workover activities. This photo over, sort of grainy photo over here on the right is a uh, a well swabbing unit. So um, I happen to be on a site and uh, witness the huge plume <laughs> of gas that came off of that. Um, that gets directed when they do well maintenance. So typically, the the resultant emissions um, will be manifest out of the tank. Um, and the same with well liquid unloading. If that's going to be a um, operation that's measured, you know, just collect the description of it, the duration of it, the physical well parameters. This is well liquid unloading is a source that's already required for reporting once you pass a certain threshold uh, in EPA's greenhouse gas reporting subpart W. So they have an estimating methodology there. And so the parameters that go into that methodology would be good to collect on site. Um, and then production that's actually occurring during the measurement, um, barrels of oil, gas, and produced water and, and um, scuffs of gas. Next slide. Um, the other thing we'll want is, well, this is one person, this is my opinion. <laughs> this is why it's ripe for dialogue. But to estimate emissions, we need these kinds of process samples. And to understand the speciation and composition of all the emission streams. We need these kinds of samples. And we, want to, we ultimately want to understand the composition of the emission sources out there and how much of it is methane and ethane versus VOCs versus hazardous air pollutants. So the first one on this list is pressurized liquid samples uh, that are uh, collected from the separator. Um, and it's samples of oil and produced water from there, um, from the separator that's immediately upstream of the storage tanks. And uh, this picture over on the right comes from CARB's regulation for mandatory reporting of greenhouse gases. And it's their appendix B test procedure for determining annual flash emissions from oil, condensate, or produced water. Um, 
next sample would be the raw gas or the field gas off of the separator. That would be the same gas stream. Well, that, that'll be the gas stream that is the associated gas uh, with, that is associated with oil production. And it'll also be the gas stream that's used on site for um, powering pneumatic devices. It'll be the, the gas stream that's used for fuel gas for any combustion equi equipment on site. And it will be ref the, the composition of that would be reflective of fugitive leaks upstream of the tanks. Um, and then the stock tank oil sample. So that's um, to get the API gravity and read vapor pressure. Um, and then finally, a sample and analysis of the waste gas stream that's routed to any on site flares or combustors and a flow rate measurement of that stream. Next slide. So as uh, Ethan brought up and many researchers that are on this call have found when they've been out there that a large proportion of the emissions uh, come from these atmospheric storage tanks. Um, and so uh, these parameters that I've uh, noted here on this slide are all things that, that relate to either the estimating um, methodologies to determine emissions from tanks or have, uh, we've found have influenced um, the amount of emissions um, observed from tanks. So uh, the pressure and temperature of the inlet, besides these, these pressurized liquid samples that we just talked about, that's critical. But then you need the pressure and temperature of the inlet separators or the VRU towers or any other intermediate uh, pressurized separation that's just prior to the atmospheric storage tanks. And, and one thing that we found through experience is, is to rely on calibrated instruments to do that versus the uh, gauges on the equipment. Um, then the oil from the separator to the storage tank, you know, is that dumped in batches or is it flow continuously um, can influence the amount of tank emissions. When it's dumped in a batch, then you're getting this, um, you know, volume of pressurized oil with entrained gas in it dumping to an atmospheric storage tank and you get this peak instantaneous flow of flash emissions, which can overwhelm the pressure settings, um, which is 0.4 here, the pressure or vacuum relief settings on, on pressure relief devices on the tanks, like these pressure relief valves, and I'm pointing to it with my cursor, which <laughs> I'm just realizing now you can't see, but uh, down to lower right, vertical brown, that's a pressure relief valve up top there. That, and, and there's one up on the photo above it. Um, and then you can see the little, the, the tank thief hatch over here on the bottom right corner. These valves, pressure relief valves and thief hatches are pressure relief devices, and they can have different settings. Is it a two ounce setting or is it a 14 ounce setting? But that can, um, that can weigh into how much emissions are relieved from pressure relief devices. Uh, and so it's good to note uh, the, temp the pressure settings on those thief hatches and pressure relief devices. Um, and then the tank thief hatches themselves, even the gasket type is good to note because different gaskets have different uh, durabilities for the uh, product that's being contained in the tank. And so are there differences in that that's causing uh, some to have more um, leaking uh, emissions? And then finally, uh, we've talked before about the trucks coming to the site to uh, if, if you're not connected for liquid transport by pipeline, trucks are coming there and loading up. You know, is it auto gauge tanks or manually gauge where then somebody has to open up the thief hatch to gauge the tank? Are the thief hatches open or closed during truck unloading? Or are, uh, are the truck loading emissions routed to a control device or not? Um, I'll just finish with this one. This picture here is a, a dump valve. And I, I just thought this is a pretty neat picture to show this indicator in the middle where someone could look at the dump valve and see, oh, it's closed completely. Um, because that's been something else we've seen with the 
um, at production pads when the uh, dump valve gets stuck open, either on the controller side or in the valve itself and doesn't seat completely, then you can just have this continual gas stream. Again, another example of unintentional gas carry through going th through the tank and manifesting out of the um, pressure relief devices. Next slide. And then if there is a glycol dehydrator on site, um, I mean, in the Uinta Basin, for example, we have about 1800 wells that have glycol dehydrators on them. As Ethan mentioned, typically you'll see the glycol dehydrators in the um, in midstream uh, compressor stations. But with glycol dehydrators, these are the types of parameters that we would need to um, estimate emissions from uh, those from that process equipment and that, you know, and since you need those parameters to estimate the emissions, those are the parameters that influence emissions. Um, here's a couple photos of, of glycol dehydrators. Um, down in the lower right, it would be, well, I, we could spend time just on glycol dehydrators, but I'm not gonna do that. So we'll move on to the next slide. And then, Combustion sources, um, and I would, you know, from my uh, perspective, the byproducts from combustion, uh, one, can have some hazardous air pollutants in them, and it, it does seem to be something that there's a, a more data gaps on. Um, so we have emission control devices that can be combustion sources. Uh, so. Uh, we have here on the top left a photo of an enclosed flare or combustor, and then below that another enclosed flare combustor. So they can look different depending on the um, make and model. On the top right corner is a what we refer to as a candlestick flare, and this would more typically be associated with associated gas with oil production, whereas these enclosed flares or combustors on the left would be associated with the controlling the tank emissions, uh, typically. Um, and then when you get into candlestick flares, as shown on the right, you know, how many flare tips are there? Is there a high pressure tip and a low pressure tip? Um, is there air assist used in the flare? Um, you know, one thing we found in preliminary research in Region 8 with the enclosed flares or combustors is that many spec sheets don't include a minimum uh, flow rate or minimum back pressure. And, and we found that with really low emission flows, which can happen in the ebb and flow of tank emissions, uh, the combustion efficiency or destruction efficiency uh, falls precipitously uh, with these enclosed flares. So making note of, of things like that is where this list comes from. And then there's other combustion equipment on site like tank heaters, the reboilers that are part of the glycol dehydrator skid, line heaters, <clears throat> the separators or heater treaters, the pump jack engines, uh, VRU compressors. So uh, there's a lot of combustion of that field gas going on at site. Um, so what's the heat rating capacity of that equipment? Is there a combustion control on it like a air fuel ratio control? That's that photo here in the bottom right with the air fuel ratio control at the base of a tank heater, for example. And then I think I'm done. Am I Donna? Next slide. I mean, yeah, Anna, up, that's sorry. All, all your slides. Thank you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Cindy. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, Cindy, if you if you think you're done, then you're done. Um, <laughs> we we have several questions um, for Ethan, and there, none came in during your talk, other than I, I, a question about the your slides, and it, I believe they were showing showing fully, but there was a question about that. Um, we have about a minute before um, Secretary Kenny begins his talk. I could uh, try to squeeze in one question that, that perhaps Cindy or, or Ethan, you could answer. Uh, the first question is whether biocides are used in site preparation, and if so, will the aerosols be detected by air monitoring? So Ethan or Cindy, if you'd like to try to answer that. Well, I, I'm going to defer to my to Ethan because he 
is representative of the operator community. I do know biocides can be um, some of the chemical makeup in, uh, in the completion fluids for hydraulic fracturing. They can also be in well maintenance activities throughout the life of the well, but that's about the extent of my knowledge. So I'll turn it over to Ethan now. I, I, I'm not aware of any uh, that have been used in site prep, but that's not been my primary experience area. So it's possible that, you know, some sort of herbicide or something is used. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I don't really have, uh, I've, I've never experienced that in, in my, it's usually the site preparation phase is usually pretty typical clearing of vegetation and, and dirt work as needed. Um, and we, of course, try to site to minimize those impacts as much as possible uh, when choosing a location. But, uh, but yeah, I, I'm not familiar with any of that, no. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ethan. And I think we're, it's time for our, our next speaker. So, Anna, would you please uh, introduce Secretary Kenny for us? Hi, everyone. Yep. So James Kenny is the secretary of the New Mexico Environment Department. He previously worked for 21 years at the US EPA as senior environmental engineer, and then as senior policy advisor for oil and gas. In that role, he worked with senior agency leadership and designed st strategies to support environmentally responsible development of oil and natural gas resources while working with states, tribes, federal agencies and industries on regulatory and policy matters. And I'm going to also share um, Secretary Kenny's slides. One moment, please. All right, thank you, Anna, and good morning or good afternoon, folks. Um, good to be here, uh, learning a lot. Um, anytime that we can talk about vortex breakers before noon mountain time, I think it's a good day. So. Um, Thank you for that, uh, Cindy Beeler. I look forward to, to, to more dialogue on, on the topics we're talking about. Um, the, I, I, let me just frame out my presentation and, and share with you that what I'm going to give you is a bit of a state perspective, as well as um, in, in my role as co-chair for the Oil and Gas Caucus at the Environmental Council of States, share a little bit maybe broader state perspective as well besides that of New Mexico. Um, so we can go on to the next slide, Anna. And there we go. Um, the first thing I wanted to just just give you be even pre basics, which is that the Environment Department here in New Mexico, we have the air permitting program for the state for the, for air quality purposes. But some other things that are going to come into my presentation is we have the Occupational Health and Safety Program for the state of New Mexico. Uh, so we have the OSHA program here as well. And then being that we're an oil and gas state and have been for many years, we also have uh, different programs that sort of touch the industry that lend themselves to providing some data um, that go towards the broader question of health impacts. So those are things like our radiation control program, which looks at produced water and looks to see if those facilities that are recycling produced water, or even those facilities that are operating just your normal EMP exploration and production activities are subject to licensing based on the accumulation of, of norm into T norm. So um, our, our naturally occurring radioactive material into technically enhanced. Um, radioactive materials. So a lot of our programs sort of come together around the common topic of oil and gas, but mostly what you're going to see in my presentation is that of the AIR program. So here on this first slide, uh, we, we've heard it from our prior presenters uh, a little bit about the oil and gas industry um, as a whole and then in its sort of smaller components. When we look at it in New Mexico, the, the industry itself, in terms of the emissions that they're generating, you can see that 53% of all the methane emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, I should say specifically, are coming from the oil and gas industry. Now, this type of pie chart will change state to state. Obviously, some of the bigger oil and gas states will have a bigger wedge of this pie uh, in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions. But you can also use that as a surrogate for, for the other types of pollutants we've heard a lot about, which are VOCs and HAPs, or hazardous air pollutants. The, the notion of volatile organic compounds, 
maybe as many of us know, but let's just go over the basics, that when you emit these organic chemicals with uh, combustion byproducts like NOx, in the presence of sunlight, you get ozone. And that ozone gives rise to aggravated um, respiratory issues, especially for children and um, older adults. Um, and then what, what I'm seeing here and what we're watching very closely, not only in New Mexico, but across the country is as air pollution is increasing and we have the effect of COVID um, on the, you know, the whole populace, it seems like, um, what is that going to do? So when we have a, sort of a underlying respiratory issue of COVID and then we layer on um, air pollution, or you could look at that in the reverse is how I said it, you know, what is that going to do and, and what kind of um, aggressive reductions are we going to need to see to improve air quality so that the rise of respiratory illness does not, um, does not just go uh, uh, through the roof, if you will. So that, that kind of sets the stage a little bit for what's happening in New Mexico. Most of our emissions, again, are from oil and gas with respect to greenhouse gases. And we have a lot of emissions, be it VOCs as well as hazardous air pollutants mixed in with that. So we can move to the next slide. So now, now when we layer on, we have a good backdrop. Now when we layer on what's happening, again, not only in New Mexico, but across the country, um, we worked with the US Environmental Protection Agency to conduct flyovers. So these are aerial flyovers that um, Cindy Diller referenced using the optical gas imaging camera, so infrared technology to look for emissions. And we've been doing these flyovers as, in partnership with EPA for, for a number of, of years now and um, really want to thank the, the folks in EPA Region 6 as well as in headquarters who have been working with us on this. And the flyovers that we conducted have yielded some really interesting findings. So we saw when we did the flyovers in 2020 as compared to 2019, we saw a 250% increase in leak rates from equipment uh, in the Permian Basin. Now, there's a lot of reason as to why we're a lot of investigation going on as to why that could be. Um, but like many who are affected by COVID, um, many of us in, in all of our jobs were affected by COVID. Uh, there may have been less boots on the ground, if you will, in the oil and gas field in um, the New Mexico side of the Permian um, that could have given rise to, to more equipment leaks. Uh, uh, another backdrop to think about is that while this was going on, the New Mexico Environment Department, along with our sister agency who works on, um, uh, that's our equivalent to our energy department, who works on making sure that uh, methane extracted from the ground isn't wasted as a royalty for royalty purposes. We both set out on a, uh, a ben, um, an endeavor to regulate methane as well as ozone precursors. So the backdrop to seeing more emissions was an aggressive um, partnership with industry and stakeholders to move towards um, tighter regulations of the industry. So it was not something we would have expected to see. While we're talking about the need to reduce emissions, they went up 250%. Um, so that throws in the curveball of maybe COVID being a reason why that happened. Uh, nonetheless, it happened, and when that happens, our air quality here in New Mexico is deteriorating and is within 95% of the national ambient air quality standards, which causes us by state statute to have to do something about it. Um, so again, just a disturbing trend that we saw in 2020 as compared to 2019. Okay, we can move to the next slide. So, from a New Mexico perspective, as well as many other oil and gas producing states, um, we also saw other trends happening uh, that air quality regulations across the states vary. Um, when you look at New Mexico, uh, I like to say Texas shares the Permian Basin with us. Um, and the, the regulatory scheme in Texas is going to be different than the regulatory scheme in New Mexico. 
which is why having a federal baseline is really important. And when that baseline eroded uh, in the last administration, there was uh, opportunity then for disparate sort of levels of not only um, control of these emissions, but then um, commitment to inspect and, and hold polluters accountable. Uh, so that creates a very unbalanced playing field, which then causes issues in terms of um, the health impacts to communities uh, based on those emissions. Um, and under the, the, the current regulatory scheme, um, when you look in New Mexico, we have a number of counties that are oil and gas producing counties. So the, the Northwest part of the state and the Southeast part of the state, um, we can under state law address those counties that are coming within 95% uh, of the ambient air quality standards for ozone. But when you have compressor stations and pipelines spanning the whole state, we can't regulate uh, as easily those sources of emissions um, that you heard about uh, in, in the prior presentations as you move the natural gas or oil throughout the state, there's opportunities for emissions to occur from, from just phase changes and compression and gas plants and uh, things like that that are outside of those counties in which we can regulate. So that, that federal baseline is really important to states and, and that's something that um, we're looking forward to going back to. Um, so I think we can move to the next slide. So you heard me mention a lot about what we're doing with respect, you know, that we're embarking on a, on a regulatory framework for ozone. Um, but some of the other things that we're doing, uh, and this slide sort of lays out what our quick, a quick snapshot of what our framework is starting to look like. But some of the other things that we're doing, as I mentioned, we have the OSHA program in the state of New Mexico out of the Environment Department. And one of the things that we saw when we look at the sort of big picture of emissions and then we look at the worker protection standards, again, two different units within the Environment Department, um, what we saw was that the, the exposure to workers who are on fracking crews with, res with respect to silica hazards is something that we continue to uh, see in, in occupational health and safety data. Um, we've also seen, which is not probably new to many of us who've worked in oil and gas for a while, we've continued to see that as, as we, as states and the feds control, uh, you know, look to route emissions to thermal oxidizers or flares, whatever the control device is, um, we, we really need to pay attention to gauging operations. So gauging operations is where a worker may come onto a tank battery and you know, look at tank levels and do a tank inspection. Uh, what we've seen there is acute exposures to hydrocarbons, um, oftentimes leaving somebody uh, with complete asphyxiation and then passing out. And, and there's been instances where those individuals um, have not survived those, those overwhelming um, hydrocarbon fumes. What we haven't looked at, which I think is, a, is something we should be looking at, uh, and we are contemplating this in our OSHA program, is looking at the chronic exposures of hydrocarbons and, and silica dust or fracking operations to see what those impacts are on, onto the workforce, uh, oil and gas operators. So those are some of the areas that where uh, we're also taking a a, a deeper dive. And then finally, I'll just mention that we also license um, norm and T norm operations, and we're actively engaged right now with looking at 39,000 wells, um, production wells, as well as uh, produced water operations, recycling operations, to make sure that they are properly licensed for their radioactive components. And if not, then um, what are the procedures they would need to, to take in order to de-escalate, if you will, that radioactive hazard? So um, those are some of the areas that I think that might be my last slide. Correct, yep. OK, so those are some of the areas we're looking at. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Secretary Kenny. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, we have one uh, question specific to you, so I'll ask you that now before we move on to the panel discussion. Uh, the question for you, 
Uh, do you have specific dates for the flyovers conducted by the EPA in 2019 and 2020? That is, did the leak rates increase during the strict lockdown specifically? Um, Donna, thank you for the question and, and thank the um, audience member who asked for that question. Uh, we do have specific dates and, and in, in the interest of time, I can give you a quick synopsis, but I would ask that uh, if you go to the ever popular New Mexico Environment Department YouTube channel, you may be the 25th or 30th uh, subscriber to it. Uh, but if you go there, you'll see all the videos that we've taken in 2019 and 2020 with the dates on there. So you can do a comparison, but they were roughly the same time frame in the fall. I wanna say they were October, 2019, uh, 2020, and they were also the roughly the same flyover areas um, each time. So we have we tried to create a apple to apple comparison. Um, so I, that that's the best that I can answer in in a brief context. Uh, but all the data is on our GIS map and our YouTube channel. Great, thank you. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, start working through the questions that we've received so far. A number of them came in during Ethan's talk. However, I would open it up to all of our speakers to, to answer these. A couple of them are, are more policy related and, and I'm going to uh, skip ahead to the, the technical questions uh, because that's the purpose of our webinar today. So the first one, it relates to radon, uh, something that, that uh, Secretary Kenny just addressed briefly. Um, it's rather long, so you can all see it in the Q&A with the background information. I'm going to skip to the questions. Um, uh, now, the question is also being asked specific to one company, ExxonMobil, but I would like to expand it because our purpose today is really how is the, the industry overall um, uh, operating in a way that we need to think about when we uh, do investigations of human exposure. So the question here is, uh, what are the levels of radon and radon progeny um, that, that have been recorded at the wellhead in various stages of the hydraulic fracturing process. Again, the question is asked in res with respect to, to ExxonMobil, but I would ask it more broadly um, to the extent you're able to, to answer. So what are the levels of radon and radon progeny uh, that have been recorded at the wellhead in various stages of the hydraulic fracturing process? Yeah, so I, I don't have uh, that kind of data readily available. Um, you know, I will say, so, I mean, there is radioactive material that, that naturally occurs. Uh, you know, uh, Secretary Kenny alluded to, to Norm in his talk. Um, it's a particular worker concern because you can have exposures to radiation when handling that material. Um, it is something that generally in the industry we're, you know, we're, we're aware of and, and uh, take steps to mitigate where necessary. Um, again, it's one of those things that's highly dependent on, on geography, on the subsurface uh, makeup, on um, you know, what kind of uh, material you're producing. And you know, I think that this is one of the, it's certainly one of the things that folks should be aware of in the sort of study that HEI is putting together, um, because there is potential for that. Um, I think the question goes even further in the in the Q&A into some of the downstream implications of that. And I'm not sure that I'm qualified enough to talk about that, uh, but uh, it's certainly, there is certainly radioactive material that occurs in, in some of these oil and gas streams. Okay, Cindy or Jim, you could nod if you, if you have nothing to add to that. Um, well, there, there's definitely different uh, organizations looking at this. So, um, you know, the, a recent study came out from EPA and Harvard on, on looking at uh, uh, radioactive activity monitors that are all in place and looking at the proximity to wells and what the influence is. There was a recent um, commentary that came out from the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements that was about norm and t-norm from oil and gas so there's there it, people are looking at it so you'll need to look into that to learn more about it. it and i would just add that it seems to be one of you know the, the one thing that i think ethan said or cindy said i can't remember who but i think is accurate is that this industry changes a lot this industry you know uses innovation and technology a lot to to evolve itself I think a lot of times the regulators are behind that. Um, so when we look at things like radon emissions from, from um, 
you know, wells and, and gas processing and things like that. That is a newer emerging area from my experience being a regulator at the federal and state level. So I, I agree with Cindy, this is an area of growing uh, academic research and hopefully EPA will continue in this, down this path too. Okay, uh, I'm gonna continue on with the next question. Um, the question is efficiency of line power versus on-site power. Is that driven by raw energy use or convenience? AKA has a life cycle analysis been done for different wells and areas? Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> it's a, a big question. Um, I think for today in particular, you know, we really wanted to focus on sort of what the impacts are on site. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, you can certainly have the discussion around where are those emissions? Are you just shifting them up the stream, you know, uh, the, into a different piece of, of Secretary Kenny's pie chart there? Are we just moving it to the power generation now? And uh, where is that power coming from? What is, you know, how is it sourced? Um, those are all very good questions. Um, and I think from a, an on-site perspective, uh, you know, what's driving it is, is, you know, it is an interest in greenhouse gas emissions and, and greenhouse gas emission abatement. Uh, but as well as, you know, if you don't have, you don't have to truck diesel to the site, if there's, if you have line power, you don't have to uh, handle that diesel on site. You don't have to, um, run your diesel generators, you, you know, there, there's a, it's, there's simplification involved as well for the operations on site. If you can kind of cut out that step, um, it, the, there's costs, uh, cost benefits associated with it too. In many cases, it's, it's sometimes cheaper to buy an electron than it is to truck diesel into somewhere that's, uh, that's not there. So all of that goes in. Um, and yeah, the, the life cycle considerations are, are always important. Hey Donna, I'll just I'll just add to that that I, I agree with what Ethan is saying. I think states are looking at overall decarbonization here in New Mexico. We are of of electrification. Um, so we so maybe this is a little outside of the scope of this presentation, but I think the health effects are you know we're talking about are the health effects felt in the field or are they felt when the 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 electricity is produced. So I think it's relevant in that context. In New Mexico, we're trying to encourage, and we just had uh, EOG announce or build and operate a solar powered gas plant, um, which is then less impactful in their carbon footprint at the site, as well as you know on the grid. Um, these are things that we're trying to incent through policy that have real world implications for people who are in close proximity uh, to these locations. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's so so many topics to talk about, and we are fairly narrowly focused on on humans and uh, with up, upstream operations. So, all right. So continuing on, there was a comment about Dr. Bueller's slides, and we'll check and just make sure that they were fully visible. Uh, Cindy, it looked like maybe some of the photos were cut off, so we will check that for everybody and make sure. Okay, and, and just a correction on the no doctor for me. <laughs> I don't want to get I don't want to get arrested as a, a counterfeit person. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, okay, the next question is again for Ethan, but but like others, I uh, open it up to, to you, Cindy and Jim, if you would like to, to add to the response. Um, how common are separator malfunctions or failures on the production sites? So I think it's how how common are separator malfunctions failures on production sites? Yeah, um, again, that's a Pretty specific question that I don't know if I have enough data to, to answer. You know, I do think that, uh, you know, um, Cindy mentioned in her talk that things like stuck dump valves and, and things like that, those sort of abnormal operations are a, a significant or can be a significant source of, of concern. Um, you know, that's certainly something that we're always looking at our, you know, we're, the, the, the industry is always looking at things like maintenance data and things like that to see, you know, how often are these getting stuck open? Are there better alternatives? Are there better pieces of equipment we can be using that won't, won't fail as often? Um, because, you know, things that, uh, when we have things that are failing and causing increased emissions, uh, that that's certainly a place of concern, um, and also from a maintenance and downtime type of perspective as well. 
Uh, so, you know, separators particularly, or, you know, they, it's really those valves because it's <laughs> separators aren't particularly complicated pieces of equipment. It's just a, a especially, you know, gas water type separation is just a, a big drum that allows the water to drop out of the gas stream. Uh, so, you know, the, the, in terms of how much those fail, I'm not sure, but the, uh, that there are certainly circumstances that allow uh, for increased emissions, as Cindy mentioned in her talk. Okay, I'm. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, I, I was just going to add. I mean, it, you know, and if something not working right in the separator may manifest coming out of the tank, uh, so that people are aware of that. Like, uh, if the if the dump valve is stuck open or a liquid level controller is not seated right or whatever, the emissions that you'll see will be coming out of the tank, not out of the separator. And that may be rudimentary and everyone understands that, but I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Yeah, no, I think that's a good note. I also think, you know, when considering how to examine these things, you know, a longer time horizon is, is important because as you mentioned in your talk as well, Cindy, there's, you know, the, there's ebbs and flows in terms of the emissions coming from a well, uh, which again, often manifests in a tank you have kind of these one-time events or, you know, if, especially if there's artificial lift, those type of, uh, of events that um, can have a, you know, have a, a, a pretty significant effect on the overall emissions profile at the site, uh, but they're really one-time of events or, or, or infrequent events. Uh, so I think that time horizon is important to consider when you're uh, looking at what to study. And, and Don, I'm just going to add to bring it back to the to, to something you said earlier about thinking about the effect on on population here. You know, when you have something like a stuck separator and uh, overwhelmed tank system, and you start seeing those emissions, which I suspect I can't give a frequency, but I suspect when you look at our YouTube videos, you'll see that there's a number of those instances. Um, that's when your emissions can really affect communities. I mean, that's a constant flow of emissions. That's, a, that's, that's what we worry about. And I think those are the types of engineering controls and monitoring controls that need to be present on well sites, especially when you're in close proximity to a residential area, tribal community, not that those aren't residential areas either, but, um, but you need to be cognizant of that. You know, here in New Mexico, we're a large landmass with populations far away, but not always. There can be populations very close to some of these production sites. So that, that's, that's a factor to think about. Not all well sites are located, uh, you know, from a population of, at, at, at the same level. And I, I would just add on to Jim's comments there about the, um, talking about the, relative location of a production facility versus the population um, is that we found too, or we've had instances of, of you know, really disturbing citizen complaints um, on health when they happen to be sitting in a lower, topographically lower area compared to surrounding production where emissions may be sinking down uh, at night and so anyway, I'm just throwing that out as a consideration um, when we think about where, where these campaigns will take place. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move on to, I'm going to just go in order in which they, we received the questions. Um, uh, the next one, are flame suppressors or other additives containing PFAS or PFOAs used on site? And if so, are there facilities for collecting and monitoring them? Yeah, so I'm not aware of any in the upstream. I think, you know, that's more, you see it uh, kind of downstream refinery, chemical plant type of facilities that you, you see PFAS and PFOA used um, in the firefighting suppression. So I don't know if anyone else is any more experienced than me with that, but I, I'm not familiar with it in the, in the upstream space. Yeah, Donna, we're, we're pretty active in the PFAS front in New Mexico and we, we haven't seen that. Um, 
we haven't seen uh, large quantities of PFAS being used for fire suppression at like tank batteries. It's, it's something we're continuing to look at. The larger the tank battery, the greater the need for fire suppression potentially, the greater the likelihood that it would be used there. But it's not something that we, I can speak to even anecdotally that we have information on that at this point. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and Jim, while we're, oh, while we're on you, there, there was a follow-up question to the discussion about flyovers uh, in your talk. Uh, the question is, can your, can your flyovers identify those enclosed flarings? So the, the, you should be able to see it in, so enclosed flarings, got it. Um, you should be able, uh, good question, technically, yes. Um, but when you look, you know, it depends on um, how windy it was that day, maybe, and how steady that camera was being held um, and whether you could see it. But technically, the answer is yes, you should be able to see that. Um, I, I can't think if we have any, I think we may have some on our website that show that. I'd have to double check to be sure. Um, Cindy, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say, you know, your point, Jim, about depends on the quality of the image, but you, you, you should be able to differentiate a candlestick flare from an enclosed combustor or enclosed flare. And, and in a, looking at it with an IR camera would be the same thing where if it is lit and it's operating, you know, you'll want to get the hot spot of that top of that flare, whether it's an enclosed combustor or whether it's a candlestick flare out of the field of view of the image so that you see if a hydrocarbon plume is hanging together. Um, but if you were to go to Jim's New Mexico YouTube channel, and I'm gonna sign up Jim so I can be the 31st um, person to look at that. Um, but you, you should be able to look and see as a, as a helicopter is flying over and identify the equipment there with a shadow, you know, from the height of the um, combustor or, um, you know, I, that, that's what I'd be looking for at those videos. Okay, great. Um, okay, moving on. So the next question, I... Um, I'll read it verbatim. I, I think I understand the question. So regarding the other issue with radioactive material that is a threat to workers, how are you measuring that load that is present in the scale on the trucks? So I, I, I think there, the, this is a question about concern for worker exposure while they're transporting uh, materials that might um, have radioactive material. And if the questioner, if, if I didn't get that right, please uh, clarify in the Q&A box. So uh, I, I'll, I'll just jump in on that one from an occupational health and safety standard uh, perspective, um, a, as well as our a different bureau, but that's, that's our structure. Um, but the point being is that as, as that scale builds up in pipelines or trucks, or even in drill cuttings for those who are recycling or have operations that support the oil and gas industry, um, and that radioactive material begins to accumulate. Um, we in New Mexico, these are our rules. I don't know that they translate in, they don't have a federal analog, I'll say. Um, we have a certain amount of radioactive material that would be, that would trigger licensing from the state of New Mexico. Um, we also would use internally that data to contemplate whether there would be any reason to conduct an OSHA investigation as well. Um, so our, our OSHA program, this gets beyond what I was wanted to talk about, but you know, there's always funding issues to think about, but our OSHA program would be the ones who would protect the workers. Our radiation program would be the one who would help establish whether a license was needed. Um, and how do we actually physically measure that when we go out in the field? Uh, we rely largely on industry to give us some information with respect to that. And then we also take field measurements when we go out in the field. Um, but by context, I mean, I don't wanna paint a, a picture here. We have about eight ocean inspectors and probably about four radiation inspectors and 60,000 wells. I mean, 
So like there's a, there's definitely um, uh, an unlevel playing field here in terms of us being able to ensure compliance at all these locations. So um, something we're embarking on and we'll have more to report on it. I would say the whole, the, the solid waste, there's a lot of solid waste associated with exploration and production and that can end up in landfills and land farms and, and oil field wastewater facilities. So, you know, it's figuring out where you're going to measure all that and at what point, whether it's in the truck that has scale buildup or whether it's in abandoned equipment that has radioactive scale buildup, you know, I, you know, there's a lot of potential measurement points. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to what appears to be our last question um, for the day, unless others come in, we do have a few more minutes. Would you consider production gas volume to be a useful proxy for production related well pad air emissions? Or is this a gross oversimplification given other potential air emission sources from a producing natural gas well pad? Anyone dare to answer that uh, question? There, there, there's been, you know, we've been fortunate because there has been so much air emission measurement work done around oil and gas. And I'm sure a lot of this audience members uh, have had a lot of experience out there um, at the production facilities. As I recall, one, you know, there's been studies that have tried to correlate emissions to production, and it has worked at times and hasn't worked at times. So I, I and you know, there's the discussion of the methane intensity uh, metric now, um, and so which would be you know your amount of methane emissions over your amount of gas produced. And so I think it's. I don't think it's a clear cut answer to that. And, and that you get in, you, you know, it involves a, a consideration of all the variables that can be different in the way it's operated and the way it's maintained and in operating pressures and temperatures. So I, I would hesitate to say it's a clear cut correlation. I'd agree with Cindy. I think if you're looking at a national data set, it may be helpful to contemplate uh, that as a, as a criteria with low weight, but as a criteria. Um, it also, I think we, we talk about air emissions um, and we probably all have a different pollutant in mind because not all our air emissions are equally the same. Some are you know, fairly innocuous, but could give rise to ozone. Some are acutely toxic, some are chronically toxic. Um, and you know, I think about H2S emissions from sour gas wells compared to like a dry gas well or a wet gas well, like the, the emission profile there would not be really replicated per a gas volume production. Um, so I think as you get, that might be a more helpful metric as you get into smaller and smaller units of measure like a San Juan basin versus a Permian basin. Uh, where you have the emission profile fairly static, but it's never static, um, but you have a better understanding of it. So that, that would be, it, from a research standpoint, I think it's helpful on the national level to give it some contemplation, but then I do think you have to refine it before you make any significant policy or regulatory decisions. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I think that you know production as an analogy for emissions it, you know, it, um, you know, especially when we're considering health effects of emissions, you're, you're, you know, you're going to, if you just use production as an, uh, trying to use production, uh, as an analogy there, you lose the things like the stuck open dump valve or the particular, uh, makeup as secretary Kenny mentioned of the, of the oil or of the gas that, you know, particular pollutants if, if, uh, that are in the stream. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I do think it, it is, it, you know, it is useful and sometimes the best tool we have for, um, for certain large national inventories. But yeah, when we get down to these kind of discussions and studies, it's, it's not always the best, um, best tool to use. Great, thank you. And I was, there's actually one more question. It got upvoted, so I almost escaped my notice. Um, 
the, uh, it's been referenced to Cindy's wish list. Uh, the wish list is definitely interesting. Are all or most of the desired parameters already measured, or would industry have to deploy more manpower or sensors to gather them? I think, well, it, it, the operators would probably be, uh, may have to, um, would definitely have to provide some of the information. For example, like the pressure relief settings on those pressure relief valves or built into the thief hatches, for example. That would be something that the operator probably has to look up sometimes. So uh, temperature, uh, some operators have very sophisticated instrumentation on site that's measured where many parameters are measured continuously and captured in a SCADA system. And so they would have a lot of information available that way. Um, that the slide that was all about the sampling would be stuff that needed to be done on site when the work was, when, whenever, whichever sites are getting measured and however they're getting measured, uh, those are samples that would need to be collected. And you would want the operator involved in that because some of them are pressurized and, you know, it's scary. <laughs> so you definitely want the operator involved in that. And then sometimes the, for example, pressure and temperature gauges on the equipment, on the separator may not be that accurate nor calibrated. And so we do have, or, or there have been recommendations in the past when you collect those pressurized liquid samples from the separator to measure that temperature and pressure with a calibrated uh, gauge that you bring to the job. So it, it all depends on the sophistication of the design at the site uh, about how much additional work there would potentially be for an operator or not. Hey, Donna, can I, can I just make a plug here? Um, I don't know if we're going to get a chance to do it, but for, for any researchers who are interested in working with the environment department, I can tell you um, for, for things like that were on Cindy's wish list, uh, if, if there is some interest, we are fully open and receptive to that and using, um, using our resources to supplement uh, any research projects in the Permian or San Juan basins that give rise to understanding uh, how protective and uh, or maybe unprotective our current regulatory scheme is or what the impact to communities uh, is looking like. So happy to work with operators, researchers, um, NGOs, anybody on that front. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and I think the, the only thing I'll add to, to kind of that comment is just remembering how highly variable things are across geographies and basins and things like that. You know, trying to take you know, we can get very detailed information from one well or one tank battery or one, uh, or, you know, one um, compressor station. And then, but then trying to understand some of those broader effects can, can be just as hard. So it's, uh, you know, that's sort of um, a, a couple of different things to think about as, as we go through this kind of study exercise is that highly variable from geography to geography, site to site. Uh, you know, operator to operator type of, of work. Great. Well, we've, we've gone through all of the questions. Uh, there may be more. We have all of about just less than two minutes left. Um, before we sign up, I just want to give our speakers, well, first of all, thank you very much, but I also want to give you an opportunity if there are any final remarks you'd like to make. I would just say just th thanks to everyone for joining and you know there's this is a really great discussion today and really important work I think to make sure that we have the the best understanding we we can of, uh, of everything that goes on throughout the, the industry and um, appreciate everyone's time and and all the talks today. I, I echo what Ethan says. Thanks a lot for your time and HEI Energy. This is exciting. It's an exciting project and and you've really got a lot of good people involved in it. So I look forward to following progress. Yeah, and thank Great. you. Thank you for all of our attendees. Also, um, our speakers for their wonderful um, summaries of unconventional oil and gas operations and policy and research needs. Um, we'll be posting this webinar on our website as, long, uh, um, as well as the slides. 
and stay tuned for announcements of other webinars um, from HA Energy. And again, there'll be a survey that pops up on your screen um, right when you exit the webinar. So again, thank you everyone, both our speakers and our attendees.